kind of have a little bit going on. Doesn't it help that I've picked up a bit of a soft rope as well? Oh, really? Only start coming on about an hour and a half. Because I'm, I'm one of these people that moves yeah, around. Yeah. I don't think this room Okay, no worries. Yeah, yeah. I'll, 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 hang, so I'll hang around. Yeah, 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 it's cool. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there are microphones up here as well. Yeah. Which, which apparently will pick up as well. So oh. you might be able to kind of walk back and forth. You know, it's just right. one. It's just one of those. Just, I don't know. I'm. I like to kind yeah. of. A bit of animation. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. Tell me about it. Always is when I'm doing stuff. Turn down. Can it be turned down? Because I usually get. Because it says something to 1220. Where is it? Yeah, but in here. My trouble is keeping to time. Because once I start, I can just talk. I'm I've done like, I'm What? I'm getting my head out now. So I don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not doing you know, if people have been going to my talks in the last year, you'll have seen all of this. So I don't know. Pardon? Yeah, I'm not doing it. I have got one new person, so. Someone died last year, they got really excited because they were really interesting. <laughs> when I read their obituary. It's awful, isn't it? It's a bit of a race for Yeah. It's a Oh! Uh, <laughs> How much influence has she had over that? <laughs> yeah. Mine's down to dying it too much and it, for, and it kind of being ruined. <laughs> You know, I've seen it six months ago, I had to be really short, it was awful. But at least it's no longer pink. <laughs> <laughs> it was orange for a while. It was pink. Did a bit of purple, I did blue. Blue didn't work. Blue was bad. It works on Angie, it does not work on me.
Just to be quite clear, I am not going to mention Drupal at all in this, just so that people know what they're getting themselves into. Yeah? OK. <laughs> <laughs> and just sometimes you people see people coming into the room and you think, I hope you've got this right, and you're in the right room. But I am not going to be talking about Drupal. Okay? Well, I, I thought about doing that, but actually, I've on purposely avoided anyone in the Drupal community because uh, that's a bit weird. <laughs> they might think I'm getting obsessed with them, which I am, but I don't want to tell them. <laughs> I don't want to admit my own failings. <laughs> Actually, I'm quite glad that door stuck because it's weird isn't it, when people are coming to a closed door. Doesn't lock. Do you not find yourself put off when you walk up to a room and the door's closed? Yeah. I do. It's no big deal. Just until we get to time. It's five past, yeah? Yeah, yeah. I think we're going to get who we're going to get. said something. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'll make a start. Um, so, I'm Rachel Lawson. I, actually I probably should explain who I am. Oh God, yeah, I had orange hair as well, I forgot that one. Uh, <laughs> I am the community liaison for the Drupal Association, which is a new position that started at the beginning of this year. And I'm trying to get around and help make sure that both the Drupal Association understand you uh, and you understand the Drupal Association. That's my job. Uh, I, it turns out to be quite difficult. <laughs> it's quite a lot of work. Um, but we're enjoying doing it and we hope that if you have any things that the DA can be doing, uh, that you'll come to me. Uh, I'm based in Europe. This is our big move into kind of having a proper presence in Europe, and I hope it kind of goes down well, um, and and so on. So I recently stopped coding and started talking to people, which is interesting, and listening. But I still sprint, I still mentor, and I still go around to camp, uh, Drupal camps on my motorbike because I love it. Uh, not this one, though, because, frankly, snow. No, just not doing that. <laughs> OK, so I wanted to do a talk about my, my tech heroes. This has got nothing to do with Drupal, but actually everything to do with Drupal. And the reason that I wanted to do this was it's got a bit of history. So at the beginning of 2017, I was re reading tweets and a study, actually the study was in the US, it was a US study, but it applies here as well, about why young women currently don't apply for STEM university subjects as much as young men. STEM, uh, science, technology, engineering and maths. 
our math, I think it was it actually said on the paper. I, I kind of got a little bit angry at this because I thought, well, there's loads of, and they were, they were saying the reason people didn't do this was because they had no uh, heroes to look up to, no, no, no role models. And I was like, there's loads of role models. And I kind of rattled off a few in tweets, in angry tweets at the start of the year, like a bit of a rant last year. And then I made this kind of ridiculously rash promise, for want of a better description, where I said, I'll put slides, I actually said three, and in the actual fact I did one. Uh, one slide at the start of every presentation I did in 2017 about a different uh, role model, uh, a female role model in, in uh, tech. Uh, and I did quite a few. And then that went well. It seemed to go down quite well. People seemed to like it. And I thought I'd just do one session. This would be the only time I do this where I put them all together and just talk about the people. So I'm not going to talk about any technology, just people. And I kind of went around and, as I said, I kind of got involved in a few things and talked at a few places and did these things. Okay. I thought, well, I'll put these things into chronological order, <coughs> all these people I wanted to talk about. So we'll start at the beginning. If I'm going to talk about technology, and computing, particularly because it's a subject of mine, where does it start? Where does it start? Where, where did we first start talking about computing as a subject, as a practical subject? What time? What year? Well, it was early enough that actually the only photo I've got of someone isn't actually a photo, it's just a painting. So, the Countess. Ada Lovelace is where I want to start. Now, Ada Lovelace's history is kind of interesting. She was born to parents of Lord Byron, the poet, and Le Anne Isabella Milbank. And Lord Byron is a very famous poet, but he's also a bit of a famous, how shall I put it, he was an interesting guy. <laughs> he kind of moved around about. Actually, Ada Lovelace was his only legitimate child, but he had quite a few <laughs> from what we could work out. Um, and Ada's mother, uh, Anne, was, how should we say, when Lord Byron just decided, oh, I'm off. I'm off to go to Greece and fight in some war in Greece of independence or something like this. Uh, and generally other things too. He was an interesting guy. He just left the family, yeah? A month after Ada was born, okay? Byron being a poet kind of gave Anne a bit of a downer on poets, for want of a better description. And so she taught Ada maths, engineering, math, uh, science, all that type of stuff, and really pushed it on her. And she was good. She was really good at it, and she studied like mad. Um, and she wrote <laughs> a lot. She also made a friend with a guy called Charles Babbage. Uh, very strong friendship, that's all it was. Uh, and they both, work, both, work, both worked on his idea for a machine that could do calculations. Uh, I think called a difference engine. That's what he called it. Now, Charles Babbage kind of saw it in a very simple way, but it was Ada that saw the huge potential of this. He saw this as a much, oh, she saw this as a much bigger thing, a thing that could change the world. Yeah? And this is her writing about it. She was, this is actually a letter from Lovelace to, to Babbage proposing that con what the calculations could do. And the machine could work things out before people even knew how to work things out. Okay, she realised this was a big deal, and she took that further. Now Charles did some simple things on it. Ada wrote in, and I'm going to have to get this right now, 1843, the first 
published algorithm. So the first example of someone doing something automatically is actually working at Bernoulli numbers, which are quite important kind of uh, sequences of numbers, um, all the way back then, 1843. And the difference engine, as it was designed, would have actually been successful at doing this. Yeah? Okay? So, not only was she good at what she did, she was good at the mathematics. She was also good at realising, kind of, you have to have a life as well. And maybe there's a lesson here. It's okay doing the coding, but remember to go and have a life too. Yeah? <laughs> she was very good at realising, you know, put this aside, go and actually, okay, going out on a horse, which I frankly, no, I hate horses. Um, but no, if there's a lesson here today, and I'm going to go through th some of these things, you put things into context. Yeah? She also was very good at teamwork, yeah? Her and Charles had, Charles, Charles Babbage was very clever with his machine, very clever at designing his machine. He was rubbish at selling it, in raising the money to make it. We're talking about engineering that was needed at the time, mechanical engineering to make this thing that was cutting edge. This was hard at the time to make the gears and pulleys and all those type of things that made this work. It cost a lot of money. Ada Lovelace knew how to, dis how to communicate with Charles in a way that Charles would listen. Yeah? And get him to give her the ability to go sell this to other people and to raise the sponsorship, etc. Because Charles was never going to do that. Yeah? This is probably, you know, like another lesson here is as developers, and by that I mean not just PHP, I mean everything, the whole, us, us creators, for want of a better description, our job is 10% code, tops, yeah? Our ability to communicate with each other matters far more because you can't do everything, yeah? You need to be able to communicate with your coworkers in a way that works. Spend time getting better at that. Yeah? If there's something that you learn in, in 2018, if you can improve how you communicate with people, you'll be a better developer. Yeah? Without touching a single bit of code. Okay, so that's Ada Lovelace. Kind of her stuff kind of came to an end. It wasn't really used until actually Alan Turin used a lot of Ada's notes for, for building his, his papers. Yeah? A lot of his stuff comes from Ada's work. Yeah? In the same way that a lot of Ada's work came from Arabic stuff and, and, and so on like that as well. Okay. So I want to move on to somebody else. Head is A, so I love Head. So Moving up a few years, Hedy Lamarr was, she was born in Aust Austria, uh, and she married early, but someone who would kind of never let her fulfill her potential, wanted her just to be a lovely wife, and that's not really what Hedy wanted to do. She wanted to be an actress, and actually she wanted to be an inventor. So she left her husband, jumped on a ship to America, you know, like, as you do. Uh, and met people on the ship who had owned a studio in Hollywood. By the time the ship birthed <laughs> in America, she was an actress. <laughs> Quite how she managed that, I don't know. <laughs> but she became a really successful actress in leading up into the 1940s. Okay, 30s and 40s. Uh, loads of films. Uh, she was really good. But in the evenings, she wasn't doing the normal going out and partying. In the evenings, she was going back to her trailer, wherever, at the set. And she was working on her inventions. It's kind of bizarre. I love it. I think it's fantastic. 
Uh, and she, she was good. She invented some serious stuff. So, and this one's particularly beautiful to me. Long story, I used to work for a, a defense company. Um, now, Hedy, in 1942, worked with a musician guy to look at torpedoes. Because, you know, torpedoes are quite useful when you're trying to defend your shipping in the Second World War. Uh, because they wanted to be able to control the torpedoes. Yeah? Send them left or right. But if you did that by radio, then the ship could just block the signal. What Hedy invented, or co-invented, to be more strictly strict about it, was she invented a method of moving the frequency from one place to another, apparently randomly, but actually it was a preset sequence, um, that meant that it couldn't be blocked. So somebody couldn't block the torpedo. They could steer it with impunity, and it would hit the target, probably a German battleship or something. That was the thinking. She got her, she got her patent. She approached the US Navy. So this Hollywood actress walked into the US Navy officers and said, I've got this patent, and it's for a torpedo, and it's going to do this. And it uses the same principles of a player piano, you know, like the uh, card and stuff. What do you think the US Navy said? Yeah, on your bike. <laughs> they, they just didn't take it on at all. Of course, by the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis, after the Second World War, so we're talking 1962, Cuban Missile Crisis, something like that, um, this was standard in every US Navy submarine. Yeah? Frequency hopping not only became standard in submarines, in, you know, in, in, in torpedoes, it's also the principle of making the signal more reliable in Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, GSM, LTE, basically virtually every radio protocol we use these days where the devices are moving, from, moving around and are mobile uses frequency hopping because it makes the signal more reliable. And that all comes down to a patent that Hedy Lamarr did in the 1940s. Okay. She didn't stop there <laughs> because, you know, that she's only invented pretty much something we all use every day and, in fact, we're all using right now. Um, <laughs> she then, she, she had a really good uh, kind of relationship with a guy called Howard Hughes who was, uh, used to design and build aircraft. At the time, Howard Hughes' aircraft were not very efficient. Yeah? They were a bit, in fact, actually this is afterwards, after, after Hedy had done some work. Basically, Hedy spent time, learned aerospace engineering from scratch, you know, like something you do when you're after, after you've been doing your day job, uh, and then redesigned Howard Hughes's aircraft based upon the principle of looking at the fastest bird and the fastest fish, working out what was the common denominators, yeah? In other words, using them to design shapes, and then building those into aircraft. Howard Hughes himself described her as a genius. Um, but really, what she was doing was learning how to do something first, then proposing a solution. Yeah? She just put the effort in to learn. We can all do that. Yeah? Some of us got a huge opportunity at school to do that. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> Hedy was a, a bit of a character. And... She wasn't really recognized for all this work while she was doing it. She was only really recognized later. And in 1997, the EFF 
wanted to give her a kind of recognition, so they awarded her an honour. And Hedy at the time had become quite a recluse uh, due to various bits and pieces and <coughs> lack of appreciation from people. She'd become a bit of a recluse. And her acceptance speech for this award was literally, well, it's about time. I kind of like that. <laughs> One day I'll get to use that. Okay. I'm going to move on to another person. Well, six people. After the Second World War, Jean Bartek and all those other people, you might recognize the name Bartek, by the way. Let me know if you do. Um, was one of what's called six human computers. Because the term commu computer came from people used to be a job to sit there and work out the numbers. Yeah? People used to just sit there with a piece of paper and work out calculations all day long. That was their job, to do maths all day long. We called them computers. <coughs> After the Second World War, someone actually built a computer called ENIAC in the States, which is one of the very early computers if you read enough Wikipedia, you'd think that it was the, the earliest, but clearly it wasn't. That was a British one. <laughs> There's a lot of American stuff on there. Um, so, ENIAC. There were six people who were employed to program ENIAC, to make it do things. So, all these people had built this computer, and then they got six all women to sit there and program it. But <laughs> it was the first one that had been built in the US. Yeah? And it wasn't as though there was reams of documentation saying how to do things. There was literally no documentation. OK? The actual system was masses. This is actually ENIAC and people working on it. And if I could remember which one was Jean Bartik, I would tell you, but it's one either the left or the right, and I can't remember. Um, they, had no doc they had no documentation. <coughs> they had a circuit diagram. Yeah? That's it. <laughs> so what they had to do was create that documentation and learn what to do and mentor each other on all the different bits that they learned. And they worked as a team and over five or six years they made this thing do what it was meant to do, which kind of sadly was work out uh, armament, how far um, guns would fire and stuff like that because because uh, artillery tables are quite important if you're thinking that World War III is about to start. Um, so Jean and the team, they, they kind of worked on that. They became mentors for each other. A me mentorship and learning isn't something that you need to wait and it, and it be an official thing. You're all doing it in your jobs right now. Yeah. It's a good thing. It's how you grow and it's how other people grow. Work together. Yeah? Jean herself actually went on to take this mass of plug boards and instead of having the program put into the computer by plugging in wires, she actually made it so that the program was stored in the actual memory of the computer. Well, I say memory, it only had like 300 bytes or something. Yeah? Um, so, yeah, that, that, that's something that she did. And that was one of, the f one of the first stored program computers. It's kind of incredible. OK. Jim was over in the US, so I think I need to talk about someone who was British for a change. Mary Lee Woods. 
And that's not, a ta- that's not a typo, actually. I'll come on to that in a minute. Mary Lee Woods, born in the UK. And she was one of the people that was employed to program, was a developer, because it was a big women thing then, of a computer called the Ferranti Mark I. This was the first computer that was commercial. You could buy time on. Yeah. So if you were a business who needed uh, all of your accounts doing, maybe, yeah, or something like that, you wanted to do some calculations, you would buy time on the Ferranti Mark I. Um, now, not only was uh, Mary really kind of good at doing that and was great, she worked in a whole team. Uh, and the team was mixed. There was, there was guys there, there was women there. But whereas, how can I put it? They talked to each other. They discussed their salaries. And do you know what? The women were paid less than the men. <laughs> so in the 1950s, this, is, this was early 50s, I think it's 52. Um, Mary Lee Woods had a little bit of a problem with this. And in fact, all of the women on the team had a bit of a problem with it, because frankly, it's not on. So she was elected to be spokesperson and went to the owners of the company and kind of said, come on, this isn't on. 20 years before the Equal Pay Act in the UK, Mary Lee Woods got guarantee from uh, Ferranti to change that, and they were all paid equally from that point on. Uh, she, made, she did that, and she, she later got involved in some of the Equal Pay Act type early kind of getting that up and going. Uh, but she definitely achieved it completely within her own company, uh, which is kind of a really big deal. Not only that, but she, she then moved on from there because when she was at Ferranti, she met, she met a guy, uh, Conway Berners-Lee, uh, and they got married. And Mary wanted to leave Ferranti, uh, so she did, so when her first child was born, uh, she left for auntie, but she enjoyed developing. That's what she did. So she actually became, which she actually ter- termed it at the time, cottage industry programming. She became what is possibly the first freelancer. Who's a freelancer here? I was until recently. <laughs> okay. Um, so Mary Lee Woods is the first freelancer. Um, and she kind of worked from home while she was looking after her son, Tim Berners-Lee, um, while she was working on things like London Transport Executive, working on simulations for bus routes and stuff like that, so you didn't end up with the buses bunching up together. Uh, so she did that kind of from home, freelance. It was kind of cool. It makes me think, I'm sure there's been a Drupal project last year that was something to do with uh, transport and trains, but I can't remember who, who was working on it. And I was trying to remember who it was. Oh. Uh, so, yeah, so quite apart from the fact that uh, Mary Lee Woods, Mary Lee Berners Lee, that's a lot of Lees, um, was amazing in the fact that she worked for equal pay. And the fact that, you know, we are all equal, simple as. She also developed this whole freelancing thing all on her own just because she kind of felt like it and made it happen. Quite how she was working from home at a time before the internet, I have no idea. Was she doing this all on cards? I don't know. I couldn't find out, actually, how she did it. Um, I might try and give you a chance to find out later. Okay. Next person. Oh, I forgot to say what this was about, didn't I? When they were programming the Ferranti Mark I, <laughs> they, it was direct machine code, yeah? 
and they had a keyboard, you know, a traditional typewriter keyboard. And they would have the instructions, so they knew the instructions, the machine code instructions, and they were all binary numbers. This is how they would input stuff. So if they wanted to input a zero, literally on the keyboard, they'd press a slash. If they wanted to input a one, they'd press an E. A two was an ampersand. That's how they were doing it. <laughs> yeah. That's actually, the for want of a better description, how they were inputting the instructions into the machine code to create programs. They were typing that. Don't ever complain about PHP again. Yeah, you can complain about SAS, it's okay. <laughs> okay, so, ah, leads, now we're talking. Okay, Sophie Wilson. Sophie Wilson is ace. Sophie started her career in the 1970s. When she was at university, studying computer type science, she, just in an Easter break, decided, oh, I don't know, what should I do? Well, I know, uh, there's a company, there's a farm up in Harrogate, near where I'm from, who need to feed their cows. She designed, in the 70s, an automated cow feeder. That's okay. An automated cow feeder that was, that was built on a tiny little computer with a 6502 processor, which is like a cheap processor at the time, cheap 8-bit processor. Um, <laughs> that's just a thing out of, you know, out of college. Uh, and eventually she kind of got into actually work and she was employed to work on initially some, someone had discovered she was working on uh, cat slot machines. Yeah, you know, you know, pull the thing and all that. People had worked out how to get around them by making a big spark next to them and it'd start paying out. Yeah, it's not ideal. Uh, so she built a thing to tell the one-armed bandits not to pay out if this electromagnetic pulse spark was nearby. And they'd worked out how to do it with a little shortwave radio that was hidden inside the, the slot machine and so on. So it's quite clever. But because of all this work, she got employed by Acon computers at the time. And she was working helping design some of the early Acon British computers uh, that were around. Now, in the early 80s, very, very early 80s, the BBC wanted to do a TV program about computers, personal computers, because they were just becoming a thing in the knowledge of the public. And they'd approached a few companies, Sinclair was one, Acon was another, and said, we've got this specification for a computer that we want. It has to be able to do X, Y, and Z. And Herman Hauser, the, the owner or co-owner of uh, Acon, said to Sophie and her compatriot, Steve Ferber, uh, can you build a computer, a demo computer for this spec that we can show to the BBC? He told each of them that the other had said it could be done in a week. You know, from scratch, you know, like you do. Um, <laughs> a bit cheeky, really. I don't recommend doing this to your colleagues. Um, and they literally sat down. Sophie sat with Steve. Sophie designed the whole system from Monday till Wednesday. Yeah, and that's a diagram of the inside of a BBC computer. Uh, they then got the soldering, literally got the soldering irons out, because there wasn't anybody else that was going to do this. There wasn't some thousands of people at Acon then. It was like a dozen people. Well, that's including the accountant, you know? So they sat and literally soldered together a computer, yeah? 
two hours before the demo, they had a computer. It was a working bit of hardware. No operating system. So Sophie sat down with two hours to go until the guy was going to turn up from the BBC and ported over the operating system from another computer that was vaguely similar, ran on the same processor, basically. Um, called, renamed it BBC Basic. And not only did it port, but it was fully functional for the demo. So in a week, they'd, op they'd ported an operating system and built a computer from scratch. Yeah? It's kind of cool. It's a, bit, a nice bit of teamwork. Yeah? I think the thing that did matter, though, was not only did she do it, but she then wrote down how it worked. Yeah? It matters. It matters that you sit there and you write the documentation. Yeah? You communicate, you work with people, but you write that documentation and you make sure it makes sense. Because if you don't, people are constantly going to be coming back to you asking questions. Yeah? Being able to help other people build on your work <laughs> is what makes tech hero in my mind. Yeah? It's not enough to build something amazing. It's always thinking, who's going to come after me and build something from this even more amazing? Yeah? So building that, that documentation was everything. However, being safe, he didn't stop there. The BBC was pretty successful. Yeah? Lots of schools used them, obviously. Well, you know, people bought them. They, they, they did okay. They did pretty well. And they wanted to do something new. And it, this was the time when Apple were kind of bored of their Apple II, and they were looking at something new, and the IBM PC was kind of coming out. And they thought, right, well, we need something a bit faster than a 6502 processor. Okay, what is that? They went to Motorola. Ooh, too expensive. They went to Intel. Way too expensive. Uh, what can we do? Oh, I know. I saw this presentation in Berkeley uh, about RISC processors, reduced instruction set processors, and maybe we should just build our own. Remember, this is a small company in, in, in Cambridge. Yeah? Not thousands of people. So, over the next Actually, some places it says 12 months, and other places it says 18 months. Over the next 18 months, Sophie and Steve, again, I don't know why they get these two work together so well, um, designed a processor they called the Ad Acon Risk Machine, um, which was a very small processor. It had no, none of these bits that you have in modern processors called microcode where you'd have software actually running within the processor. It was all hardwired, yeah? Which meant, actually, it did some really quite clever things. Like, you could stop the clock, yeah? Which meant that you could take a processor that was running at, say, 100 megahertz and say, well, actually, we don't need the processor for a while. Stop it. And the thing with the stopped processor is it consumes no power. Yeah? Okay? Or you can slow it down. You can't do that if it's got microcode for some weird reason that is beyond my understanding. Okay? And it also only had 30,000 transistors. So, Sophia designed this. She'd, she'd, she'd um, written emulators for the processor. She actually wrote an emulator for the entire processor weirdly in 808 lines of BBC Basic. Quite how you do that, I don't know. But it worked. Now the thing, the thing with ARM as it became known, and this is a very early example, I think it's an ARM2, um, is it got quite popular. Apple used it. Apple used it in the Newton. Who had a Newton? I did. I wish I still had it. <laughs> I was given it, it was amazing. 
Um, and it kind of got picked up by a few things. It was really good at not using power. Really good. Also, because of the way that they then sold the processor, they didn't make them. What they did is they got other people to make them. They just sold them the design. Yeah? ARM is now used in everything. So far as I can work out from reading and research, this has got 11 in it. Yeah? <laughs> OK? Because ARM processors are not just used as the main <coughs> processor. They're used in the Bluetooth module. They're used in the Wi-Fi module. They're used in uh, the one that records me doing my steps. Uh, there you, you, what's it called, the motion code processor, some rubbish, I don't understand. Uh, but they're all over because they're so cheap. Yeah? You buy a license and you make as many as you like. Go for it. Yeah? Last, what was it, 2010, so this is years and years and years ago, 10 billion were produced. Basically, the world is flooded with ARM processors now. Everything from what from Sophie's work, yeah. Uh, but you know that's what you get for doing good things. So I hope they were interesting from last year. I've got some slides. If you've got an iPhone, get it out now and use the camera because I've got some links for you. And there are some TV programs. So if you point your camera at this, you should be able to get the link to the TV program rather than me writing it down. Um, and yeah, if you just point the iPhone camera at it, it should come up with a link and then you can save it. Uh, this program runs out soon on the BBC iPlayer website. It runs out in like five days. It's been around for a while now. Yeah, it's really interesting. It's really good. Um, okay. And then there's a, there's a whole film coming out about Hedy Lamarr. I really, 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 really wanted to show it at Nashville, but for long, complicated reasons, I can't. Um, mainly because she's running around without a top on in one of the things, and it's kind of difficult uh, to show that at a conference. Um, so that film comes out. Go watch it. Yeah, it's mega interesting. I've, I've, they sent me a copy of the film, and it's amazing. It's really good, really interesting. Uh, and then there's a whole load of interviews with, Ma with <laughs> Mary Lee Berners-Lee. <laughs> That's why I said Mary Lee Woods with a, with a uh, <laughs> Bond name, first of all, because I can't say that. Uh, that's a load of interviews with her in, in audio format. Uh, are they working out of interest? Is that working? Yeah, yeah brilliant. Okay. Right, it's the first time I've tried that. Okay. So... And then one there for for Sophie as well. That's the last one. She's still alive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She 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 works for Broadcom. Up in Cambridge. Uh, she lives in uh, Lode, uh, which is kind of east. Okay. Okay. That's my rant over. Okay. For all of last year, I was having a complete rant at every session. I am not doing this again. Moving on. <laughs> but are there any questions? No, I didn't think so. <laughs> oh. um, is it paid or sorry? Uh, Hedy Lamar, yeah? Hey, sorry. Um, how did you know anything about how she actually broke down that barrier? I think, so you're asking how did the barrier break down so that the US Navy used it? So my understanding from what I've read is that she was initially turned down and it wasn't that Hedy did anything. It literally was af after the Second World War, uh, after Hedy had tried, um, com completely by coincidence, a researcher at the US Navy was reading patents um, and spotted the pattern, not that it was connected with Hedy in any way. They didn't know it was connected with Hedy, 
Hedy Lamar. And in fact, actually, they never, actually, the US Navy never paid their patent fees. <laughs> Mind you, what are you going to do? Argue with the 12 inch gun? You know, it's one of those. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, they, they, they completely ignored the fact that it was Hedy that did it. Um, but they, they started using it because it was a good idea. Uh, and in fact, it was a massively fundamental idea, as you know. But yeah, the, I think that maybe they just didn't take Hedy seriously when she walked in and, and presented to them. Read into that what you will. Uh, it probably was for a lot of US sailors, yes. <laughs> it probably was. It, literally tragic. Anything else? Oh, well, thank you very much. I hope, I hope it, I kind of hope it's useful and interesting and, and stuff. It, it's just what I was doing last year and having a rant about more than anything. <laughs> Uh, between these and Harry Oh, right, you're right. Yeah. Go back occasionally. Not too much. Yeah, haven't Yeah. Yeah. I do like Harry Yeah. Oh, cool. Oh, brilliant. Leeds is a good physics. proper place for physics as well, isn't it? Uh, I think so. Yeah. yeah. So I think she chose it last time. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Oh, okay, cool. Oh, that's oh, that's it's very easy to do in Leeds, actually. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you very much. Oh, that's okay. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, so, first of all, I am a Migrating and CLB bars. Oh, God. Yeah, that was a nightmare, wasn't it? I remember now, yeah. Oh, is that a year ago? Yeah. yeah. But it's like, in one, I don't know, And then it's like, oh, right, where's that? Oh, because this is... That's okay. So I teach, uh, teach design school. Oh, cool. I'm trying to... Oh, I don't know. 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 That's a great place to be. I think, yeah, so the STEM thing. It was I didn't come from the middle STEM. Yeah. And yet, I... James. James Glyke, he wrote a book called Video Series Open Information about history of computers. Big chapter. I haven't, I haven't read that, no, I'd be interested in that. Yeah. But um, yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I'm not sure how to do it to introduce. And I'm going to find more men and women taking a bit of a chance to. Yeah, I think it's because, yeah. It's just tough, but I mean, the design is going to be really interesting. Just the way they think, yeah. Maybe they are connected. Maybe certainly. it's a subject of a tweet or a thing. Like, <laughs> so yeah, but thanks very much. And, um, yeah. really oh, I'm glad you liked it. I know it's useful. I, I worked on Oh, I used to work for a defence really? company. So that's kind of interesting. Yeah, it's kind of. Well, I didn't personally. You did. Yeah. Oh no way. Really? Just, I, I was doing laboratory testing in a, in a holiday job, and it was testing the gunge that keeps wires onto big drums. So wires yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, they do. So yeah. Or fibre, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's how to you get to be flying away with a big drum of wires. Yeah. It's good to keep it on the drum. Yeah. If it's just sticky enough to keep it, it does. on, it's not too sticky that it'll snap it. Yeah. And getting this machine that could rip apart a steel bar. But it could also fall too slightly with a gunge and measure the force. Had a whole summer doing that. So you mentioned to me, I was like, oh, shit, I had. Yeah. It's amazing because, yeah, I mean... Last student holiday job, but... Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, because I mean, the company I worked for did like uh, torpedoes. Because th there's, there's a problem with torpedoes that uh, once you reach a certain speed, the pressure wave on the front will stop a detect a sonar style, a passive sonar 